last time I ended with a discussion of drift velocity. And I want to come back to that uh, because I didn't have a chance to go into more detail. So when we had a simple circuit like this, we said that the longer bar of the voltage was positive and the shorter was negative. And that tells us that the current flows in this direction. Uh, but then we said that current is the direction that positive charges would flow. And that's because when we or when scientists were first studying electricity, they didn't understand what electrons were. So they just said that positive charges were moving and based all of their theory off of that assumption. Uh, now we know that that assumption was incorrect and that uh, what is moving are negative charges called electrons. And so they would be moving, the things that are actually moving in your circuit are electrons and they're moving in the opposite direction of the current. The other uh, kind of misconception that you might have is that, let's go back to thinking about current. You might think that if I, turn on this battery, then I have a whatever charge starting here. And then let's say that this is a light bulb. Maybe you might think that the light bulb won't turn on until this specific electron makes it to the light bulb. But that's not how uh, electricity works. So instead, the electron and let's just sit, focus on the electrons moving now. The electron that starts here doesn't need to make it all the way to the light bulb because it's gonna bump into the electron next to it and so on through the circuit until a, an electron gets bumped into the light bulb or into the resistor from the one that's next to it. And then an electron that was in the resistor is gonna get bumped out of the resistor. So because we turn on a light switch and the lights instantly turn on, you might think that the charges are moving very quickly through the circuit. But as we'll see with the calculation that we're gonna do, the drift velocity of the electrons is actually quite slow. So the equation that we have for drift velocity, so that's V with a subscript of D, is the current divided by 
the density of free electrons times the charge or yeah, density of free electrons times the charge of one electron and then area. So this is current. This is free electron density. And I'll discuss what that means in a moment. Charge. And so this is the charge of an electron because electrons are the things that are moving. If you had some other charge that was moving, then you could use a different charge. But for circuits, electrons are the things that are gonna move. So this is usually for electron. And then this is the cross-sectional area. of say a wire that the, the electrons are moving. So what do we mean by the free electron density? So for this, uh, if you've taken chemistry, you might think back to chemistry or um, as we'll see later, this gets into quantum me mechanics and atomic physics. But basically, if you have the nucleus of an atom, which is protons and neutrons, then there will be different bands of electrons maybe it should be in a different color i'll draw the nucleus in a different color so this is an atom and then these are the electron orbitals. Now, in whichever, so maybe I'll draw another one. So whichever orbital is the furthest away, is called the valence band. And the electrons in the valence band are called valence electrons. So those are terms that you probably have heard in chemistry. Now, what makes metals special, well, one of the things that makes metals special is that the electron in the valence band is free to move about the entire bulk of the material. So if you think about a gas, the electrons are kind of a, not attached to, but they're going to stay associated with whatever nucleus they started orbiting around. But in a metal, the electron is not confined to stay with that nucleus. It's free to move about the entire material. And so it's these valence or free electrons that make things like metals good conductors. So we were talking about the electrons bumping into each other. Well, if you have a bunch of free electrons in your material, then it's really easy for them to bump into the electron next to them. 
because they're not confined to stay attached to this nucleus. So the free electron density is just how many of these free electrons that you have within your material. So you count up the number of electrons in a given volume, and that's how you get your free electron density. So this would be the number of free electrons divided by some volume. And that'll just be some property of the material. So for different metals, they'll have different free electron densities and that property can determine how good of a conductor that material is. So let's go back to our definition of drift velocity. And now that we know what all of these terms mean, current, free electron density, charge of an electron, and the area, let's do a sample calculation for a copper wire. So the free electron density for copper is approximately 10 to the 29 electrons per meter cubed. The radius of a typical wire is one millimeter. And then the charge for an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the 19 coulomb, negative 19 coulombs. And so I'll give you guys a minute or so to calculate what the drift velocity is. And then let's say the, the current going through your wire is, uh, let's say two amps. So, If we plug our numbers into our formula, we have two for the current divided by 10 to the 29 for the electron density, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 for the charge of the electron. And then for the area, I, And then 10 to the minus three squared because one millimeter is 10 to the minus three meters. I didn't actually calculate that area. I just plugged it directly into here. And so when I plugged that in, I got, uh, so four times 10 to the minus five meters per second. Uh, the takeaway from this is that, so if you think about how far it is, say from the light switch to the light, that maybe that's a meter away. So it would take like 10 to the five seconds to get from the light switch to the light bulb, but you see the lights come on instantly. So the individual electrons are not traveling all that distance. They're just bumping into the one next to it, but that bumping in process happens so quickly that the light comes on as soon as you flip the switch. Okay. So that was drift velocity. And uh, specifically this was for uh, direct current or DC circuits. So here the, 
So in words, one electron bumps into the one next to it. But they all move in the same direction. So you have, this is your wire. Then the electrons are just bumping into each other, but they are still moving in this direction at the drift velocity that we just calculated. But direct current isn't the only kind of way that we can build a circuit. And the most common that we use is alternating current or AC circuits. And so in words, what's happening here is that, so one electron moves back and forth. And this is what delivers the power for electricity. So in the direct current case, that electron is, so it doesn't, if you have the battery, the electron doesn't need to travel from the battery to whatever you're trying to power in order for it to get power because it's bumping into the one next to it. But eventually it will get to whatever you're trying to power. In an alternating current, the if this is your battery, and this is your electron. It's just going to move this way a little bit. And then it's going to move back this way. So DC, the electron is eventually going to go all the way around. But in alternating currents, it's just going to move back and forth. So the electrons are still passing into and out of whatever you're powering. It's just that instead of them only passing in one direction within the DC circuit, they're entering and then exiting from in the AC circuit. So electrons are still going in and coming out of the thing that you're trying to power. It's just how they're doing it is different. So to power whatever you're trying to power, you just need electrons going in and coming out. So that's why both of these ways work, but how they work is different and there are gonna be pros and cons to both of them. So we've done the drift velocity with the direct current. And now let's look at what the current and the voltage will look like in an alternating current circuit. So if we wanted to plot, so we'll put time on this axis and then in red, I'll just label it when I draw it. So in red, we'll have the current. And in blue, we'll have the voltage.
Find this one. So blue is voltage. Red is the current. And you plot them with this kind of a sign graph. So whenever something is alternating, you can model it with this kind of a graph. So first, as a conceptual question, if we're using, so I guess I'll just ask. So does voltage always have to be higher than current? Or I guess maybe the does the magnitude of voltage. Okay, so I've got one person saying no. Uh, what do other people think? Could I draw it like this and label the voltage as the higher one for a reason, or was it just arbitrary? I'll tell you that it is valid to have the current be higher than the voltage. So these are both valid, but something is different between these two graphs. So, so both are valid. Uh, but if you think about one of the formulas that we use that uh, has both voltage and current in it, uh, what, what would be the difference between these two graphs? Uh, resistance. It's, so if you do V equals IR, then for this top graph, uh, this is showing that resistance is greater than one ohm, right? If you take your current and multiply it by some number bigger than one, then your voltage has to be bigger than your current. But down here, your resistance is less than one ohm so you take your current and multiply it by some number less than one, then your voltage will be less than your current. And so this is an example of, even though we're doing alternating current stuff now, the, this Ohm's law still applies for alternating currents. And now there's one, one thing that is different when we're dealing with um, voltages in, and currents and AC circuits versus DC circuits. So if we label this as V max and this as the max, current, oh, I guess I max. Then if you wanted to do some calculation, like calculating what the resistance is, you need to use what's called the RMS current or the RMS voltage. 
So this is, you, you take the max and then you divide it by square root of two. So the RMS means root mean squared. And this is just a way to take into account the fact that you're not receiving the max voltage all the time, right? The voltage is changing. It starts at some high number, and then at some point it's gonna go to zero, right? Like right here. And then it'll go to some negative number, go back to zero, and then go back to its peak. So if you just multiplied by the max voltage or the max current, that wouldn't be a good example of what the circuit is doing at all times. So a better thing to do is to use this RMS value where you take that max and you just divide it by square root of two. So any questions about what to do with AC circuits? So in the, if a problem is talking about an AC circuit, it'll either give you the RMS value of the current and the voltage, or it will give you the max and then you'll have to calculate the RMS voltage. And then another thing, the resistance is just the resistance. It doesn't have an RMS value and it's not, the resistance is not alternating with respect to time, just the voltage and the current. So then the last thing that I'm gonna talk about today is uh, power distribution and how we get electricity into our homes. So power or electricity. Distribution. So earlier I said that uh, we use alternating current like Pretty much everything in this building is alternating current. The power that the power company generates and sends to your house is alternating current. So uh, we use alternating current for our electricity system, our electric grid. And you might wonder why that is. And the reason is a little complex. And once we learn about magnetic fields, we'll come back to this question. Uh, but for right now, what, uh, what we can understand is that in order to transmit electricity over long distances, we need to use high voltages. Okay, so then you might ask why, so there's two questions that you would ask. Why high voltages? And that, that we're gonna answer on the next slide. But then you might ask why are AC circuits better 
then DC circuits for high voltage. And the answer for this is due to uh, how we generate high voltages, and that's going to be from magnetic fields. And we'll start talking about magnetic fields in a few weeks, and then we'll come back to this question and you'll understand why uh, it's easy to make high voltages using magnetic fields when it's an AC circuit rather than a DC circuit. But for right now, all you need to know is that we want to use high voltages and AC circuits are better at high voltages. Why we need to use high voltages comes back to what we talked about with resistance. So so why high voltage? So we've seen this equation for Ohm's law, we've seen this equation for calculating the resistance of some object. And we've seen these three equations for power. So now let's think of a uh, an electric cable like that runs on the power lines that brings electricity from the power plant to your house or the school. Let's say you needed to transmit your power 100 miles away, or maybe we'll do 100 kilometers, so the map is easier. The thickness of typical power cables is 50 millimeters squared. And the resistivity of, uh, so power cables are usually made out of aluminum, uh, not because aluminum is the best conductor, but because it's cheap to get aluminum compared to copper or other materials that are better conductors. And when you have to run hundreds of miles of cable, uh, that cost can add up quite a bit. So the resistivity of the aluminum cable, let's say, 10 to the 2.65 times 10 to the minus eight ohm meters. So first we can use this equation to calculate the resistance of just the uh, wire that the electricity needs to flow through. 2.65 times 10 to the minus eight. Then the length, so 100 kilometers, which is like 60 miles, uh, would be 100 times 1,000 meter to get to convert that into meters. And then if we want to convert this millimeters squared into meters squared, we would take do the fence post method. So 1000 millimeters and one meter. And then you have to square that to get millimeters squared. So take 
50 divided by 1,000 squared. And this would be 5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared. So now everything is in meters. You plug that into your calculator. would get 53.4 ohms. So that's not necessarily a negligible amount of resistance, right? So as soon as you start needing to transmit power over large distances, now the resistance of your wires actually matters. So when we're doing stuff in the lab, the distances are so short, you don't really need to worry about the resistance in the wire but you transmit it over long distances. And now because there's this L in the equation for resistance, now the resistance matters. So now resistance matters. So if we look at this equation for power, the bigger my resistance is, the more power I'm gonna lose from say, for example, the wire heating up. So how we can counteract that, so if resistance goes up, then my power is going to go down. And we don't want to lose power, or we want to lose the least amount of power possible. So how can we counteract that? We can counteract that by increasing our voltage, and then our power goes up, and that can offset the amount that we lose from having the resistance. So the more voltage that you can transmit your electricity over your wires using, the less power you're gonna lose. So why do we need high voltage? Because our, uh, lines that we use to transmit electricity have resistance. And because they have resistance, we lose power and you'll lose less power if you use more voltage. So that's why you wanna use high voltage. Now, if you could, uh, there's a, a principle called, or a phenomenon called superconducting. And that's when a material has no resistance. So uh, if you, can discover a uh, superconducting material at room temperature, then you'll win a Nobel Prize and you might like stop climate change because we don't lose a bunch of power through wires. So uh, like this has a lot of real world implications. Um, so I know you guys are all biologists, but if you study physics, that's something that you could work towards.